Welcome, everyone. Um, glad you can join us here at the Open Education Conference. My name is Dr. Jeff Seaman. I'm presenting here with Dr. Julia Seaman. We're both from Baby Analytics, and we'll be giving you a lot of information about from our series of reports on U.S. higher education awareness use and speculating a bit about the future for open education resources. Next slide. Um, three major areas we're going to talk about today. Uh, Trends in OER awareness in U.S. higher education. And we've seen this, we've been measuring for quite some time. You'll see in a bit you know, how long our time series is. But just trying to understand what's changing, how rapidly it's changing, and a little bit about why. But really then saying, how has the pandemic really changed this? Because it has. It's changed so much about U.S. higher education and the factors that are driving OER adoption, OER awareness are among those. And then finally, how are those changes altered what we expect the future to be, both good and bad for OER, and a bit about some speculative where we think things are going and what's going to drive those changes. Next, please. Um, so we are Bayview Analytics. Some of you may know us under our previous name of Batson Survey Research Group. We are a research firm. We do a lot of research in higher education in K-12, mostly around areas involving technology use, uh, course materials. Um, it's both research on that is survey-based research for faculty, academic administrators, and students. Uh, next slide. The particular work we're going to talk about today is the, coming from the series of reports we've been doing on open education resources uh, beginning in 2009, although uh, one of the key metrics we're going to be talking about, we began in 2013, and Julia will talk about that in a little bit, that these 10 reports, all of whom have as the primary sponsors the Hewlett Foundation, so we thank them very much, um, have been in a consistent way addressing U.S. higher education, faculty and administrative responses, and as much as we could, consistent questions um, so that we can track areas of change over time. The cover you see here on the slide is our most recent report, came out in June, uh, Turning Point for Digital Content Curriculum. And that's out on our website. All of our reports are available on our website. They're all released under a Creative Commons by license. So we invite you to use them however you wish. Um, there's also a research brief there from that same data set on open education resources becoming mainstream. Uh, again, take a look at that. Let us know what you see. And if you look at the timeline, you'll see there are two more that we have coming up in 2023 and 2024. So we absolutely would love to get your feedback. What do you want to know? What can we add? What questions do you want answered? Um, next slide. One of the things you have to do when we do all of this stuff across a period of time is make sure that we use consistent questions, consistent definitions, so that our data is comparable from year to year. So beginning in 2013, these are the definitions that we use to present to potential respondents in our surveys. And we kept these definitions and the actual question wording identical throughout that whole time period. And so that we want to make sure that we can really understand that the changes we're seeing are due to actual changes, not to anything artificial about rewording the question or changing our sampling methods or anything like that. So this is clear we have a definition from OER that what came at that point from the Hewlett site. Um, and we also have definitions for public domain and creative commons that are part of our survey outreach. And we've used them consistently. Um, next, please. And I turn it over to Julia. Yes. Um, thank you. And thank everyone for joining us. Um, so I'll be going into a bit deep dive of the data, um, especially focused on our most recent um, results. And so just as an overview of the data set, as Jeff mes mes mentioned, uh, we have been doing these surveys for over a decade now. 
And our data set um, for the OER awareness really begins in 2013, which is the first survey of, with the question in the format that we're still using today. Um, and then we can break down these periods into uh, so two distinct groups. Um, the sort of next five years or so of results, um, which we sort of classify as steady as she goes um, period for OER awareness and growth. And then we have um, the last uh, two or three years worth of results, um, which are obviously the pandemic years. Um, and so both of these time periods, so sort of each one has its own unique disruptor that's coming in and sort of impacting how the OER um, awareness and growth um, is being affected. And so the first disruptor that comes in is inclusive access. And I'll talk a bit more about that when uh, we get to the data set. And then obviously the largest disruptor um, for basically everything um, has been the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and so we're going, I'll take you through um, these data sets and then I'll leave you um, back to Jeff um, who will discuss a bit more about the future and uh, the impact of the COVID-19 especially on the future of OER. So jumping in, uh, 2013, as I mentioned, is our really baseline data set for the OER awareness question that we have. Um, and it's not unexpectedly um, pretty low on awareness overall, um, almost 75%. So three quarters of all faculty are unaware of OER. Um, and you can see that only 17% of faculty report being aware or very aware of OER. So this is really our baseline level of OER awareness for our surveys. Um, and then we know OER awareness um, is in itself not the only thing. Um, we're also interested in OER use. Um, so actual use of OER materials in the classroom. And so we have self-reported data from the faculty. And so in 2013, only 5% of faculty, so one in 20 stated that they regularly use OER materials. So these two data points are sort of our baseline um, data sets that we went into. And then we'll use these questions year over year to start seeing the trends in time. So jumping into what we saw for OER awareness, um, since that report up to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, so this does not include the pandemic year, this is going to the year right before um, any pandemic effects. And so what we saw is that um, just the most recent year pre-pandemic, uh, that, that in awareness increased to two in five faculty were very aware or aware. And then we can also see on the time series chart on the right that uh, OER awareness has actually grown year over year. And so that's where the study as she goes um, description for this time period comes from, is that so every year we see very nice but small growth in the level of awareness as well as the depth of awareness. So you can see that the total um, of all three bars um, increases as you we get further in time. I'm showing the total level of awareness is increasing, but we also see that the depth of awareness, so the total number of faculty saying who are there are very aware is increasing as well. Um, so that's showing that faculty are learning about OER and learning more and becoming more familiar with it over time. Um, and so, as I mentioned, we also uh, look at OER use. And so we saw that the awareness growth um, that I just showed you was also matched by a lower but steady increase in OER adoption and use. And so what I'm showing here is faculty reported use of OER materials as the required course material um, that they so self-reported as required material. And we split it up between all faculty, so sort of the total level of OER use as well as faculty who teach introductory courses. And so what you can see is that year over year, uh, we do see an increase in the use of OER. Um, and that partners with the increase of OER awareness. And we also see that the increase of use was really strong in introductory courses. Um, so there's been, uh, it's not a sort of overall universal increase, um, but definitely some pockets were picked up a lot more OER than others. Okay, and so this leads to our first um, really big disruptor of OER. And so that is really inclusive access. And so to say the stage for this, um, commercial publishers were really looking for sort of the next big thing. And uh, most of their strategies emphasized 
moving to digital first or digital only distribution of the course materials, especially textbooks. And so we see that this um, commercial push for inclusive access was also coming from the idea and acceptance of digital materials. So the market dynamics um, suggested that an accelerated con conversion from print to digital is feasible. So getting teachers and faculty and students to move from print textbooks to digital um, now had finally set the scene. So the mid 2010, so like 2015 is um, really where this comes on strongly. And then uh, this also is a brand new arrangement. And so inclusive access as so used today and described is a subscription-based marketing where students are paying a fee. Um, and this fee is going into tuition or their student fees, not through bookstore or actual uh, textbook purchases to access a suite of online digital resources. And so this is actually a really big competitor and a net impact for OER is that um, these inclusive access programs are actually able to offer an alternative to some of the benefits of OER as digital course material in a cheap and often sort of jazzy package coming from these commercial publishers. Um, and so what we saw and we actually measured um, was inclusive access awareness um, in a similar way that we measured OER awareness. And what was kind of shocking to us was that um, inclusive access awareness uh, had grown to the same level as OER awareness, but in a much shorter time span. So in a few years that we were measuring this um, in our surveys, we saw that OER, sorry, uh, we saw that inclusive access awareness had reached um, the same level that it took OER awareness to do in 15 years. So this is a really fast paced growth. Um, and so from our data set from 2019, you can see that 20% of faculty stated that they use OER or that's used at their institution with an additional 15% saying that they are aware of inclusive access. So this is these levels um, of inclusive access really rose quickly um, and really became a competitor there both to traditional print media as well as to OER and alternative um, commercial textbook opportunities. Okay, so leading to our next uh, disruptor, um, and this is really the big one that we'll be talking about. And so this is the COVID-19 pandemic. Not going to go through everything on the slide, but really just wanted to set the stage and remind people because it has actually been a few years about how things changed so quickly um, and how that impact um, was shown to the higher ed and general um, life as well. Um, so going from December, uh, when the first cluster of patients were identified in 2019 um, in China, it only took three months till lockdown started. And so that uh, very quick change, and then there was about over the next year um, where we had very sort of distinct patterns of um, how higher ed, ed responded based off of other parts of the pandemic, such as the vaccines, um, lockdowns ending, and travel being open. And so this actually leads to some distinct phases in higher ed that we can see sort of labeled here, which are really um, the first phase of an emergency switch. Um, so that's uh, higher education institutions closing or going to remote learning to more sort of standard remote learning to going um, to reopening um, with more reopening and then finally to today where they may actually be considered getting back to normal and on campus in person classes. Um, however, uh, some of the larger themes for the COVID-19 impact on um, higher education is that we know that this so it was a universal impact across um, the country as well as the globe, where 90% of enrolled learners actually had their schools closed um, in the spring of 2020. And then we also saw that there was a decline in students attending higher education institutes as well. Um, so that's sort of a larger macro uh, impact with COVID-19. Um, but going a bit more to the specifics within the classroom, uh, we've actually measured quite a few effects, um, and I'll be going over them. The first being that the teaching modality drastically changed and has not returned to pre-pandemic levels. Um, you can see in this uh, graph that we were able to track that change from in-person pre-pandemic trends to that 
change to um, emergency remote and online learning, and then sort of back to this quasi normal sense. And so um, our the face to face learning pre pandemic of uh, faculty stated 96% of them taught at least one course face to face, then during the pandemic that dropped to 14%. And then it went back up to 58% um, in our most recent survey. But you can see that it's still not at the um, pre-pandemic level. And then um, so complementary, we see that the changes in online only learning, um, whereas roughly a third of faculty pre-pandemic jumped up to 71% during the pandemic. And it's fallen back um, in our most recent year, but it still has not fallen back to the pre-pandemic levels. Uh, we also saw that uh, faculty themselves are aware that the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted their teaching. Uh, we see that 91% of teachers believe the COVID pandemic will impact their future teaching experiences from their own um, sort of self-identified awareness of it. Um, and over half of those are substantially or moderate changes to their uh, sort of future teaching experiences because of the pandemic. So the pandemic had a lasting effect on the faculty in higher education. Um, and one of those effects that we measure um, is actually how they want to teach. Um, and so we asked faculty if they would like to teach their courses as a combination of in-person online or fully online format. And we see that the majority of faculty, over 50%, uh, want to teach online, and actually over 60% want to teach, sorry, that almost 60% want to teach as a combination. Um, so this is a really interesting finding where uh, definitely showing a change in how faculty are thinking about the future. Um, and one more aspect that we measured were the perspectives from faculty on digital versus print. Um, and overall, while this trend was occurring pre-pandemic, it really picked up um, post-pandemic, where we see that faculty agreement with the statement, students learn better from print materials than they do from digital, has the decreased um, year over year. And so the lower number of faculty agreeing indicates that there's a stronger preference and acceptance of digital materials over print materials. Um, and so you can see the decline from over 40% in the 2018 and 2019 school years to over 30%, so almost 10% drop um, from that post-pandemic experience. So now, what did that mean for OER awareness? Um, and so tracking back to what we saw for the uh, pre-COVID pandemic, uh, we just added our most recent data set to there, and we can see that trend actually continues strongly, that uh, there is a continued growth in the OER awareness by higher education faculty. Um, and in fact, this is the first year where we have over 50%. So one in every two faculty are aware of OER at some level, um, which is a really big threshold to pass. Um, and then we also see that OER awareness has more than doubled since 2014. So in less than a decade, the awareness has doubled, um, which is actually a pretty strong uh, awareness. And so the question of course comes up is what will happen next year? And so we'll talk about that a little later. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, OER awareness of course needs to be coupled with actual measurements of OER use. And so during the pandemic, we see that, uh, and immediately pre-pandemic, we see that OER use is actually stalled. Um, and so you can see the comparison between 2018 and 2019, are basically the same uh, percentages of faculty reporting they use any OER material as required materials. Um, and so that was just setting up for pre-pandemic, but once we get um, and ask again after the pandemic, we see that it really picked up. Um, so there was a stall and then um, the year after the pandemic, so, so the first year getting back to the classroom, we do see this um, massive jump from that 15% in 2019 to 22% um, in our most recent year. And that means that one in five faculty are now requiring OER materials. Um, and this is asked about their largest course enrollment. Um, and that's up from one in 20 from the first time we measured. And so that uh, one in five, uh, which is actually 22% of faculty requiring OER materials, is also combined with an additional 18% of faculty who are using OER materials as supplemental course materials in their classroom. 
So we're getting close to that 50% um, threshold that we crossed um, with OER awareness, but not quite there yet for OER use. Um, and so with that, I want to switch back um, to Jeff to give you a little bit more of the sort of summary and takeaways um, and also our future predictions. Uh, thank you. And so coming out of here, so this is a number of listing the factors we've been measuring over a period of time. So one of the things we saw is that um, faculty with online teaching experience, faculty with experience using digital materials, and faculty who were making changes in their courses were all more likely to adopt OER. Oh, but the other thing, you needed time. So faculty who had the luxury of time to do their pieces were likely, but if you didn't have that, then the, the time necessary to find and find the proper materials just wasn't there. Um, also, if you didn't, if you wanted supplemental course materials, um, OER materials were not as rich with the supplemental materials as most commercial uh, offerings were. And the other thing that was changing was cost. We saw that cost went from not an, a non-issue for faculty to an incredibly important issue um, and a big differentiator from for OER versus commercial. But that has gone somewhat away with the advent of um, the inclusive access program. So, how are these things, these factors, going to now change going forward? Uh, next slide, please. So first is our con one conclusion is absolutely clear. So the, the world is becoming overwhelmingly digital. Um, it, it was moving highly into the digital world before we had a pandemic. The pandemic just made it happen so much faster. Um, the commercial publishers moved m massively towards digital even faster than they had been planning. Um, Institutions did massive, massive changes to support digital distribution of materials, and faculty used digital materials for the first time, many of them for the first time, and found they liked it. Um, we also think that inclusive access is the new norm. Um, it, publisher models are such that they're doing this in a as a, their now central distribution model is digital first, digital only, um, that uh, subscription models are what they're, is sort of the norm of what they're working from as opposed to individual devices in bookstore or something like that. So this is the new norm and what we think the world's gonna be. Um, and we also saw um, that OER is continuing its growth. So we saw it halt, halt and then have a big jump, but that jump was essentially the missing year and its year. If you do the did the line out there and assume that each year had done the growth, we'd see that pretty much the same rate as we've had before. So this is what we think unless. And so next slide, please. Um, the things that will change this, first is initiatives. We have seen through multiple studies that if a faculty member is aware of an OER initiative, no matter where it came from, their department, the school, um, state level, whatever, they are three to four times as likely to adopt OER than if faculty members were not. So we know that that's a change. Um, OER marketing is changing, and we think that's getting better. People are much more aware of different names out there in OER. And there may be changes to inclusive access. We saw a lot of resentment towards early publishing models. Is that going to happen when we, when inclusive access, in particular, that inclusive access models are often moving decision out of faculty hands into higher levels in the institution? This is what we absolutely need to measure going forward. Um, next. Thank you. And we hope you enjoyed us. Um, get everything you want from our website. All the reports are there, available free. We also have um, information form you can fill out. So thank you so much. Thank you.